welcome to Censored. I'm Aoife Vertnach. And I'm Lloyd Maeve Houston. And this is the last episode of season 11 of this podcast in total and season two of the film subspecialism that we have recently established. <laughs> but yes, it's also, I'm sorry to say, sort of a pause in the censored universe. We're going to take a little break. Not because we have ourselves been censored, <laughs> but uh, but but only because um, yeah, other writing commitments and 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 things uh, mean that our our attention needs needs to be elsewhere for for a little while. But this is a a hiatus rather than uh, a a conclusion. I think it's fair to say. Absolutely, yeah. Not least because I'm writing a book on the censorship of publications, so. I'll be back to bore the arse off of you about that at some point and maybe even write something about film. Plugging away at it. <laughs> Absolutely. So yeah, and Lloyd is obviously working on many other projects themselves. So, you know, busy people. Do you want to plug anything, Lloyd? Come on. Oh, God. Um, no, I mean, I do, to be honest, it's all just, it's, <laughs> I just need to get in a library, get reading and writing, to be honest. <laughs> just, uh, yeah, I need, need to stop, um, you know, productivity procrastinating by doing this. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no, ferreting out filth in, uh, in, in, in literary forms, as is my won't, um, is, is the order of the day. So you're continuing along that that filthy path that you have set yourself upon a number of years ago. In, indeed, yeah. So more more uh, sort of medicalization of sex and uh, more, yeah, looking looking beyond Ireland uh, to um, other national traditions of filth and transnational traditions of filth. Um, but uh, but yeah, no. It I mean it, it actually it, you know this. Um, whole undertaking has been in, interestingly productive for it. You know, it's introduced me to sort of people like Eleanor Glynn and, um, you know, the the filmography of Clara Bow and so on and things that may well uh, surface there. So it's uh, yeah, it's it's certainly um, been enriching in in ways beyond uh, merely really affording me opportunities to giggle <laughs> brilliantly with with your good self. <laughs> I'd like to say thank you for joining me as co-host because it was. Kind of lonely on my own, just giggling about these things to myself. And you did make a great difference, both to just keeping me company, but also some of the things you've said have really, you know, set off a few fireworks in my own brain. So I think you are contributing to uh, my understanding of things in ways that I didn't expect either. Well, thank you so much. Um, it's it, it warms my heart to know that. And yeah, no, no, thank you so much for, for inviting me along. It's been uh, an absolute pleasure. And uh, yeah, you know, it's the the sort of proverb about um, if you do something you love, then you'll never work a day in your life. And <laughs> this is very, very much the, uh, the way I've always felt about this. <laughs> yeah, it's been great. But to finish up, we do have, it's kind of fun that we have this amazing opportunity to speak to someone who used to be a censor an irish film censor yeah we've uh, you know we can kind of get it from the from the horse's mouth um not not that there's anything equine about our <laughs> about our guest um but uh, but yeah you know we've we've so often i guess had questions about either you know the underlying logic of censorship or the experience of watching cinema in ireland during some of the most intensive periods of the censorship. And um, our guest today is someone who, you know, I know from sort of reading other interviews with him, who I think his his sense of um, cinema was partly sort of forged by the frustrations he felt with the things that were kind of kept from him growing up in, in Ireland um, in ways that uh, we'll potentially hear him talk more about. Um, but yeah, shall we, shall we say who, who our, our guest is? Yes, our magical mystery guest is John Kelleher, who was appointed film censor in 2003, but as a result of his reforms and his attempts to change the legislation, he left it as the film classifier. So he oversees a transition in the 
uh, name and the function of the office. But he comes to the office with a very long pedigree in making film and television. Uh, he co-wrote the film Eat the Peach, which he also produced. He was involved in a lot of very well-known and very important uh, drama and news productions in RTE, the national broadcaster, and he was also involved with TV3, an independent station. So he's kind of like done so much work before he ever gets to become film censor, then classifier. And I thought he would be a really interesting guest and he was very kind enough to speak to us. Hi, John. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for joining us. We're very pleased that you could come and talk to us about your experience both as a consumer of film and then as someone involved in producing it and classifying it or censoring it later on in your career because you really have been involved in lots of stages of producing this kind of media um, because you were appointed as a film censor in 2003. Wasn't that true? That's right, yeah. I can't get away from it. I've All my life, I seem to have been, in one shape or form, associated with film. But I love it. When when did that bug first kind of bite you? Not to get too, too biographical. <laughs> I think I was about three years old. <laughs> no, maybe a little bit later. But uh, I always was fascinated by film and always wanted to go and see films, probably films that are weren't appropriate for a little boy. Um, but we used to try and sneak in if we could. Um, and my brother, who was even younger than I was, was brilliant at it. He could. He somehow managed to get in, uh, whereas they looked at me maybe more askance. I don't know. I had a friend who um, was staying with us, and uh, he, he went to a cinema. It was actually in Liverpool, I think. He was about to go back. To Ireland, we were living in the UK, and anyway, he went to a cinema in Liverpool uh, that was showing uh, an over eighteen film, and he was fourteen, and he tried to get in for half price because <laughs> it didn't quite work. <laughs> That really is rather like when you go out on a Friday night and you want to get half fare on the bus into town, but you want to get into the over 21s nightclub. <laughs> exactly. <You're laughs> Tied to ride two horses. Could you tell us a bit more about your experience watching film and in the context of the time period when there was quite stringent censorship? Did you and your friends talk about it or was it part of the sort of discussion among people who would go to the cinema frequently? Oh yes it, it certainly was I mean when I was in my if you like teenage late teenage and early adult years which would be your prime cinema going period I mean that is that you know that is the the main um, cinema going audience um not exclusively, but in the main. And when I was in at that time, so between kind of, you know, mid-teens to late 20s even, um, there were a lot of films banned in, in, in Ireland. And in fact, uh, 200 films were banned in Ireland during the 1970s, you know, when I was a young adult. Uh, so of course we talked about them and we were very, you know, to put it, I suppose, I mean, we were very annoyed. We were very angry. Um, and sometimes we were able to go, you know, to somewhere else like London, you know, and see a film that you couldn't see in Ireland. And that, you know, you got a bit of satisfaction from, from that, and then boasting about it to friends, you know, who hadn't been able to see it. But it was, all, it was a real feature of, of, of growing up in Ireland at that time. And, you know, being a young adult, but still unable to see. I mean, nowadays it's it's so everything is so available. You don't you can't even imagine a situation where you are precluded from seeing something. Were there times where you travelled specifically to see something, or was it more just a sort of fringe benefit of you know being being out of the country or being in the right place at the time? 
It was a, it, to be honest, I think it was a fringe benefit. I never, I never, I never, I don't recall ever actually, you know, taking a, the train to Belfast or going to uh, the UK, going to London to, to see a film as such, but definitely fringe benefits, you know. Did you ever watch film in a film society context or in a cinema that was showing club membership films so that are exempt from the censorship? Or were you exclusively a mainstream cinema goer? Oh, no, I definitely watched. I mean, we were, it was, it was fortunate. I mean, it was sort of the, the precursor of the Irish Film Institute and other similar um, organisations that there, there, there was, you know, there in, in, in Dublin, where I lived, uh, it was possible to see a kind of membership um, only uh, series of films. Uh, and that was, that was terrific because you did, you know, you saw French and Italian uh, and other, other films that would, that were actually banned or that were not allowed or that were heavily cut, but you saw them uncut. If you could talk a bit about how your own experiences of filmmaking and as a producer informed your approach to classification, if if it did in, in meaningful ways. I think that, I mean, that's an interesting point, but in fact, I don't think that they intersected much at all. I mean, if you if you made a, a film, uh, you you would obviously like it to get the appropriate classification. So... If you if you wanted it to get the widest audience, you wouldn't want it to be an over eighteen, because that would obviously limit it. But it didn't really impact on your thinking, because you're you're making whatever the film was, you weren't you weren't making it, with, a really close eye on on the certificate. After you'd made it, I think, it would become perhaps an issue, but I I don't ever recall or indeed any of my colleagues uh, being overly concerned at the time of the, of making it. Occasionally, uh, for example, a filmmaker might call the, the, the censor, the director of film classifications office to say, you know, if X is in the film, will it get an over 18 or will it get a 15 or whatever, just for clarification. And obviously the office would always be happy to to try to answer that, although it would be an abstract question until the reality of the actual submission. And then, you know, you watch it and, and the decision is made there. So I suppose in a way there wasn't that much relationship in the industry terms between the, produ the, produ the, the production sector, if you like, and the classification. There was a very large uh, relation, very close relationship between the distribution sector distributors and the office because it was the distributors who actually submitted the films and who had to then uh, effectively um, live or deal with the the, the the classification that was given. Were there any kind of moments that stand out in your own time in, in post where that was kind of difficult to navigate or, or fraught or, or was it fairly sort of placid waters? Yeah, there would have been a couple of uh, occasions where it, it might have been controversial or, or contentious or maybe where a distributor might think that this was deserving of a lower, uh, you know, a more liberal, if you like, uh, classification. For example, a 12A instead of a 15A. Um, and there was a slight problem always because in the UK, the the, uh, the the British equivalent did not have a 15A. They had a straight 15. So their the logic there would be, for example, if you had a a mainstream film like a big budget film, like maybe a James Bond or some some such, the the tendency there might be to give it a 12A, because to give it a 15 was too was too restrictive, whereas in Ireland. We could give it a fifteen A, and and somebody who was like thirteen could still see it if they were accompanied by an adult. They couldn't, even if accompanied by an adult, see it in the UK. So that sometimes led to anomalies, and obviously the the 
Britain being so much bigger, the market there being so much bigger, it was sometimes difficult for a distributor in Ireland if the Irish classification office was giving a more what seemed to them, but it wasn't really, but it seemed to them to be a more restrictive certificate, as in like a 15A, because they didn't quite understand that that, that that was just the same, really, to all extents and purposes, as a 12A if the adult was accompanying a child under the age of 15. So, John, I was just wondering, why did you, or did you want to be the film censor classifier when you got the job did you apply for it and ask for it i think i was the first person to apply a since the very first censor back in 1923 i think i was the first person to apply who who got the position on foot of a, an interview board uh, an advertised you know, normally it was simply just an appointment that was made. But, um, you know, things change and our society change. And uh, so anyway, yes, I I applied because, you know, I had been involved in production for, in various aspects of it for a very long time. And I thought it would be an interesting position to have for a period of time, for a short enough period, and to try to make some changes, which I, I felt were, were desirable. Uh, so yeah, that was that was really why I why I applied for it, and I, I really enjoyed the period and enjoyed being able to make the changes. So you did have a plan, sort of before you got the job. You had theories and ideas. I I had a plan, and I suppose at the interview, I I expressed it, and fortunately, it wasn't uh, didn't frighten the horses. You know, they didn't uh, they didn't think the plan was was uh, crazy. I mean, the plan was, was simple enough. It was to sort of modernise where modernising was needed, to introduce, for example, a website, which was, this is this is 20 years ago, and uh, there hadn't been a website, but but obviously there was a, there was a, a, a need for one, so I did that. Uh, one of the very first things was being able to get the name of the office changed, which in itself was symbolic and very, very significant, which was, no longer was the word censor used. Classification became the order of the day. Luckily, the initials remained the same. So IFCO, IFCO, which had been the Irish Film Censors Office, simply became the Irish Film Classification Office. And there were a few other things as well. Extraordinarily, it was the case that despite all of the um, emphasis on what could be banned, things that, that were ostensibly causes of harm, you know, to people in Irish society, like uh, as specified in the legislation, um, you know, blasphemy, obscenity, contrary to public morality. There had been, over the 80 preceding years, no reference in the legislation at all to children, to causing harm to children. And if you think about our society and the history of, you know, the decades since independence and what in some cases happened to children uh, in institutional abuse and so forth, that's really remarkable that the founding fathers didn't think to include causing harm to children. They saw film as being an evil thing, cinema, the sin, you know, a place of sin in cinema. But they didn't think about kids or about children. So it was with some satisfaction that we were able to get that resolved. And in the 2008 Act, which was an amending act, for the first time since 1923, there was uh, inputted a reference to causing harm to children. That does seem remarkable when you think about it in the context of current debates about media consumption we're always trying to work out how it might affect children and viewers who are too young for content. Um, I mean, do you think that they hadn't included children because they just perceive cinema to be so contaminating for everybody rather than differentiating? 
Exactly. I think that's absolutely right. I mean, they, they did, there was no distinction made for the first 40 or 50 years between adults and children. The censors of the day were, were actually making their decisions, cutting or banning or allowing, uh, for adults. Um, so a 30-year-old was treated in the same way as a 10-year-old was, which is absolutely ridiculous. Yes, it, it led to some egregious decisions, all right. Very egregious. <laughs> Can you tell me, just going back to your time watching films, was there one particular um, cut or ban that really stuck in your mind as a cinema goer, like one where you were really raging? I think possibly um, more, it caused probably caused more amusement than rage. Though a bit of both, perhaps. I mean, there were certain decisions, like Casablanca was before my time, but looking back at it, I mean, it was it was a, an extraordinary decision in a way. Uh, the Graduate with Dustin Hoffman and Anne Bancroft, that was very much in my time. I was in my early 20s, you know, when, when that came out. And it was, um, it was actually initially uh, banned by the censor um, in the late 60s, but it was on appeal. It was allowed in if you like, but with extraordinary cuts, cuts that, among other things, completely bewildered the Irish audience who would not have known, if you saw The the Graduate in the cinema, you would not have known that Mrs. Robinson seduced the Dustin Hoffman character, Benjamin. You you would not know that. And that's that's at the core of the film. So the Irish audience would have thought they were just having a chat and a cup of tea. They, they wouldn't have known, you know, that she uh, got him up to the bedroom. Yeah, it's such a terrible thing to have done to that film because that's the story of the film. <laughs> exactly. And Casablanca, OK, much earlier, obviously. Casablanca, incidentally, was initially banned because of the emergency the war world war ii was was going on ireland was neutral ostensibly neutral and under the emergency powers act a it was uh, precluded the film was precluded because it was seen to be um not to be to be partial not to be impartial and it was seen to be um uh, pro allies if you like and anti anti um germany uh, which of course it was, um, but so it wasn't allowed in. But then two years later, that was 1943. In 1945, when the war ended, and our neutrality was was effectively over, it was resubmitted by the distributor, and again this time it was allowed in, but with extensive cuts. And among the cuts was the fact that the Irish audience again long-suffering Irish audience was precluded from knowing that there had been a romance in Paris between the Humphrey Bogart character, Rick, and the um, uh, Ingrid Bergman character. Uh, the, the, uh, the line, in fact, we'll always have Paris, meant absolutely nothing because they hadn't had Paris <laughs> as far as Ireland, Irish audiences were were concerned. The, the reason being that that Ilsa, the character, was, was married, uh, but she had believed that her husband had been murdered by the Nazis. And so she had thought of herself as being a, a, a free and an independent woman who meets the Humphrey Bogart character, and they have a romance. But in the eyes of the Irish film censor, she was mar- a married woman, even though she believed her husband was dead. So that was not acceptable. It's, yes, (laughs) it is a bit silly. (laughs) There are some other things too. For example, in one of my favourite films, On the Waterfront, which I think won seven or eight Oscars, the the Marlon Brando character goes into a bar with an actor, Carl Malden, playing a priest. They go in for a talk and the film censor of the day cut the film 
so that the, that scene, the you see him going in, but you don't see the priest having a beer, which is what he did do in the film, because in the eyes of the censor, it was unacceptable for a priest to be drinking in a public bar. That is surely something people had seen before in Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> you better believe it. I'm fascinated, I suppose, by the idea of resubmission, actually. Like you say that the Casablanca came back to the office after neutrality had ended and policies had changed. Did you have any resubmissions when you were working as the classifier? Um, I think not not many, um, but... I think there were a couple. There was one which which was called Paddy. It was based on a book by Lee Dunn, the, the novelist, many of whose books were, were banned. And Paddy had got an over-18 certificate uh, because it sort of follows the, the journey of, a, of a, a, a randy young man who's on his way around Dublin doing things that the censor disapproved of, so it got it over eighteen. It was it was resubmitted, I think, for an <laughs> anniversary, um, and so we reclassified it. And believe it or not, the film that some decades earlier had got it over eighteen got a twelve A. That is a considerable shift in uh, social mores. <laughs> One of the things that the office does, in addition to film for cinema is it also covers DVDs, videos and video games. So maybe could you talk a bit more about how that worked for you when you were working there? Well, I think it covers uh, DVDs um, and, and videos that are, that are distributed or on the market. It doesn't actually cover video games. It, it, it will give advice, but there's an organisation which is composed of many of the many industry participants called PEGI, uh, P-E-G-I, that, that actually um, classifies video games. It's not IFCO. OK, I see. So there's a, a separate parallel classification system. It, it's parallel. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not an Irish, it's not a national Irish organisation. It's a pan-European uh, organisation plenty of the industry players are, are, you know, it's a voluntary, you know, agreed uh, classification that they that they give, that Peggy gives. I see. Right. That's interesting. It's a different way of working the classification system. Yes, but equally the internet. I mean, uh, IFCO does not have a, a role in, in classifying, for example, any of the streamers' m- movies or or any internet um, product. It's purely cinema or you know, DVD video releases. Did you find that a lot of your work when you were there was confined to video and DVD, or was it cinema to DVD? I mean, was there a distinction between the material that you were looking at? Oh, well, I suppose at any given week, you know, during the time that I was there, there would be every single week, there would be maybe five or six cinema releases. Uh, and then there would also be, when I mean, video at that time was at its height. There would be maybe, you know, kind of 20 or 30 or 40 DVDs submitted. So there was an entire um, operation of classifying DVDs uh, and uh, the, the film side of things was relatively easy, you know, be like one film a day. But with DVDs, there was a whole team of people, of assistant classifiers involved in that. Well, I'm glad to hear you didn't have to watch everything yourself. <laughs> so am I. That would, that would have been onerous. <laughs> it's interesting, you know, that the... The sort of the rationale for classification, or indeed, if you want to call it before that censorship, goes right back to 1923. The first act, you know, that was one of the very first acts to be put through uh, the, the new independent state, 
But the 1923 Censorship of Films Act has uh, one line in it which is quite remarkable, I think, partly, if not mainly, because it has withstood the test of time. It's still in force today, a hundred years later, but in a different way than perhaps it was envisaged. And that line is, in the opinion of the censor. So the legislation said, if in the opinion of the censor, a film is contrary to public morality or it's blasphemous or it's obscene or whatever, he, there were always men, he can cut it or ban it. That still applies today, even though it's not acted upon. But what is very interesting, I think, is that over a hundred years, and it is a hundred years now, 101, it's allowed the censor of the day. It's given the power, if you like, to whoever held the office to decide what should be or could be cut or banned or left alone, which meant that the, the individual censors were reflecting, if you like, the mores, the customs, the, the ethos of the day. And as our society became less restrictive and less uh, concerned with, with sort of preserving the morality of its citizens, whether they were young or old, uh, they, the, uh, that particular phrase has given the, the, the censor of the day enormous, enormous uh, freedom. And there's no question about it, Kevin Rocket uh, said, you know, uh, addresses this in his excellent book, that the, the, the history of Irish censorship reflects, it mirrors the history of the state, the social and the cultural, the political, economic history. As we changed, as we liberalized, as huge changes that we've seen came about, so too did the office. It reflected those. It never, in my view, led. It never said, you know, this must change. You know, that wasn't its role. Its role was, in fact, to sort of follow and to reflect. And it did. Do you worry sometimes that some of the earlier censors might have maybe held things back a little bit? I know what you mean by leading, but maybe that things could have moved a little quicker. <laughs> Oh, totally. I think there's no question about that. I mean, the the first uh, the first censor, James Montgomery, who was a very witty man and an intelligent, articulate man. I think he banned a thousand films, a thousand films, but not one of which, not a single one of which would be banned or cut or attract any adverse attention today. Um, and the, the early censors, the first three or four of them, were immensely strict, mostly from the point of view of Catholic morality. They were they saw themselves as moral guardians. They saw the cinema as a place, as I say, of sin, and uh, you know people were to be protected. And some of the decisions were, you know, to be frank about it. Some of the decisions were ludicrous. Like James Montgomery thought that any part of a woman's body that was displayed below the neck, like an arm or a wrist or an ankle. That was nudity for him. Yes, which is... I see, I see, I see that you're shocked by that. Well, below the neck. I mean... They didn't have to conceal their heads or their faces. Well, at least they were allowed some acting ability. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> I'm just going to see where Lloyd is and then we can wrap up if they can't come back in. Um, it's funny that they haven't messaged me so yes it's like it disappeared yes I yes. don't <laughs> I know there have been little noises like as if there's someone else trying to join but nothing has happened so and I'm not getting we're, not we're submitting by the way we're submitting that proposal that we've been working on it actually goes in today, this, this evening. It'll be going into what used to be the BAI, the Broadcasting Authority, and it's now called Commissary Ma, in the yes, Mall, yeah. uh, yeah. CNM as we call it. So they will. it'll take at least a couple of months yes. for them yes. to come to their decision. We're very optimistic. We've got a very good lineup, yourself included, 
of contributors, um, a good mix of academics, uh, industry people, um, some legal people and so forth. Kevin Rocket is a, acting as a consultant, as is uh, Dr. Morris Manning. We've got on the film side, we've got Lenny Abrahamson, Suniva O'Flynn from the IFI and Gabriel Byrne yeah. as contributors. It sounds great. Yeah. It'll be, it, and it's basically, and the working title, as I think you know, is In the Opinion of the Censor. <laughs> that's, what, that's what it is. It's a perfect title. It's a perfect title. <laughs> <laughs> that's what's interesting about film as opposed to publication. That phrase doesn't appear in the Publications Act. Uh, now I know yeah. there's more than one person, but interesting nonetheless. Yes. If there had been one person and they had that phrase, it's interesting to see what might have changed, you know. Yeah. yeah. It's probably easier for a committee to ban a book than it is for one person. Yes, you're probably right. <laughs> I think, I'm not sure, but I think it possibly would be. I mean, because if it's a committee, there's bound to be, well, in Irish terms, there's bound to be a priest <laughs> <laughs> yes, usually two, one from each side. Usually two. Side. Yeah, there was in the film case, there was always, always yes. two on the appeal oh, board. Here we are. Can you hear us? Nope. nope. Dead. Complete silence. But when we're coming to it, what we might do, if it's okay, if it suits you, is we we could sort of go through areas that you might be like happy to discuss or talk about. We we have to restrict it to film. I mean, it can't. It won't be books just simply because of the nature of things. Although there could be analogies. Um, so obviously we're uh, we've just passed, and you know one of the things that kind of set in motion this podcast itself was the centenary um, of the passage of the Censorship Films Act, um, and yeah, so I suppose I, I wonder if you had any thoughts about where the office stands today, either you know relative to that kind of starting point, or in terms of how it currently operates. Full stop. I think it would certainly be true to say that it's a very different place today than the office of. James Montgomery and the early censors, you know, who were literally cutting and banning all around them. Um, you know, it's 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 now if it's now called, for example, you know, the classification office, and that's what it does. It classifies, it doesn't it doesn't ban. I mean, we used to say in my time that we went from being guard dog to guide dog. And, you know, if, if you like, or from stop sign to signpost, if you like metaphors, we can give you a few more if you like. But it does, those do reflect the change. And the fact that today, IFCO is, it's basically there for the public and particularly for parents uh, to advise parents as to what might be the age related uh, classification suitable. Uh, and parents know that the research, they do a lot of research and they're, they're, this is corroborated by all of the research findings that, that parents and the public want to know, you know, for, from the point of view of, if you like, consumer advice. That's what it basically is. If you look at the website, it's giving, it's giving a range of uh, feedback uh, on, on a film. You know, it may say this film... Uh, contains violence, but not particularly um, realistic or, or, or gratuitous, or this film contains um, scenes that may offend people of all ages, not just <laughs> will be unsuitable for children. So it's basically helpful, constructive consumer advice. I'm really pleased and happy to have been a part of you know, introducing that and helping to make you know, move in that in that direction, and that's what it does today. One thing also that sort of strikes me about the way things operate: uh, we just recorded an episode where we were reading sort of reports from both uh, IFCO and the BBFC, and yeah, that that spirit of sort of 
transparency and and openness and a desire to kind of you know engage the public um and communicate uh you know being sort of i guess relatively novel compared to um some previous iterations um was there anything in particular that that sort of drove that shift um or you know uh, was that part of sort of changes you wanted to implement i think it was it was basically driven by a mixture of common sense a changing society a realization you know that that there shouldn't be uh, you know a man sitting in a, a room you know deciding what adults in our society are going to watch that's that's in today's world that's not really acceptable so so it's taking from there it, uh, the the fact that that adults should be free to decide for themselves what they would like to see the emphasis then switches of course to like to children and that's where ifco's main role is in terms of that consumer advice that it gives to parents for their children so i think it's a combination of factors speaking of uh, sort of younger people i know that unlike the bbfc ifco doesn't have a sort of full purview over um video games i, I think kind of you know it, it peggy it gets it sort of is, is deferred to but i know there's there's some instances where you were asked to uh make decisions about um games and as someone who, who occasionally plays video games myself i was intrigued by <laughs> your experience with with that medium and and what that logistically looked like for you well, i i didn't have a great deal of experience of it but as you say i, I think you know at, from time to time advice might be sought but it was only advice because there was no sanction the the you know ifco did not have the remit of of being able to uh, classify video games but it could it could comment or it could offer advice or it could you know and was sometimes invited to do so i i think it may be an example you're sick to death of speaking about but there was there was it manhunt 2 that you were that occurred in in your time um that you had to make a sort of decision about <laughs> my my recollection i i think it was and i i can't remember i'm sure there was frenzy i think there was i think i had to make my way through some very angry young people in Cork, I think, actually, I was speaking at it. <laughs> and uh, the fact that my family are from Cork didn't count for anything. I was abused. <laughs> I mean, gamers are, are infamously not uh, the most level-headed or <laughs> temperate of people, I think, uh, at, the, at the best of times, uh, where, uh, you know, regulation of their uh, their chosen medium is concerned so that that doesn't startle me but i'm sorry <laughs> neither are cork people <laughs> <laughs> have you have you have we talked at all about um your interactions with sort of your predecessors in the role like is is there you know what was there a sense of sort of solidarity between and among censors and classifiers or what was your experience of it fairly sort of discreet well, I think your one's experience really was, you know, if at all, was with the immediate predecessor, because obviously, you know, people, I mean, several people died in office, you know. So, I mean, I wouldn't have, I, I knew my predecessor, who was Seamus Smith, very well. And Seamus played a part in liberalising. Like, he held the office, I think, for quite, quite a while, from 1986 to 2003. And Seamus believed firmly believed like myself he was from the the business he was from the industry he believed that it was a, a, not his job to cut films it was the director's job to cut a film you know and let's leave it to the director and that was a that was completely an alien concept to the early censors who, who felt that it was their job to cut it and they did some of them even changed the titles of films are there any that uh, that stick out in your mind as uh, in terms of those sorts of substitutions? <laughs> Richard Hayes, who was the the person who followed James Montgomery, so he was the second film censor, and he would have been in the forties, in the nineteen forties, and he wasn't just content with with cutting or banning the films that were submitted to him. He, he took it on himself to actually change the titles of 
several of the films. So you have a movie called I Want a Divorce. That wasn't acceptable. That became the tragedy of divorce. Um, Honeymoon for Three. He found a very questionable title and he called it Easy to Love. <laughs> uh, Married Bachelor was retitled A Bachelor uh, Looks at Marriage. And um, The Night Before the Divorce became The Night Before. And here's, here's one now. This is like, figure this one out. <laughs> Misbehaving Husbands. He retitled that Henry Goes Haywire. <laughs> I mean, I can't. The night before has a sort of evocative openness that that perhaps is <laughs> a more more appealing. But you know, the word divorce was un completely unacceptable, yeah. unless you call it the tragedy of divorce. <laughs> I like the bachelor looks at marriage. I don't understand. Like that's such a weird title. <laughs> has sort of oddly anthropological char character to it. Yes. Even in classic movies, like, with, you know, in Gone with the Wind, I think the censor made 13 cuts. Anything to do, anything to do, even remotely to do with sex, had to go. So childbirth was associated with sex. You couldn't show that, you know, or you couldn't show a pregnant woman. Because you had to think, how did she get pregnant? Aha. Gotta go. Even if people were married, they couldn't be pregnant. <laughs> I, 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 exactly, exactly. You couldn't see them in bed, for example. Bad. <laughs> different times, I think. That's what, you know, it, it is. Those were different times. They were very different times. And those men, they were, as I said, all men. They were simply reflecting the prevailing ethos of the, you know, of, of the, the world in which they lived at that time. Mercifully, thankfully, things have changed. Thanks in part to people like you who uh, decided they had to change. You mean bringing in all this filth? <laughs> Corrupting morals. <laughs> Congratulations, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, John. It's been wonderful. Oh, you're most welcome. Most welcome. Thank you so, so much.